This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Narrative explanation of what happened in 20th century Britain and indeed what's still going on today. Um, Social scientists talk a lot now about inequality, having had about 20 years of not talking about inequality at all. Um, But to me, class is about more than inequality. Um, I very much share Edward Thompson's view that class is about a relationship between people in historically specific circumstances, um, that it is um, in essence about the um, experience of uh, unequal power um, and how people conceive of that. Um, And like Thompson, I'm as interested in how elites um, see that relationship as I am people who we might term working class. In recent years, historians have uh, ignored class um, in much of British history, or they have talked about class as a personal identity. Um, And that's not really my approach. I think that class can be an identity that is is felt at a personal level. Um, But ultimately, I think it is experienced through social and political and economic relationships with others. And for that reason, it matters whether what, what both of those groups or all of those groups think that they are up to. So I'm not particularly interested in enumerating how many people identified themselves in opinion polls as working class at any one point in time. I'm also interested in the fact that people were acted on as a working class by powerful others like employers at various times during the 20th century um, and what that meant um, for living conditions and for the shape that society took. In terms of what I sought to include and what I'm going to talk about today, I wasn't trying to write a kind of comprehensive history of the 20th century, but rather to try and think about moments where um, things had changed um, and to also to think about moments that have been enshrined in uh, official memory in Britain um, as being uh, particularly important moments, which in British official memory tends to mean that they're seen as moments of great social unity, the Second World War, um, the post-Second World War welfare state, and to try to tease out really how that happened and and whether that myth is belied by the reality, as indeed in practically every case it is. Um, And I also wanted to try to understand, and this is where the subtitle of the book comes from, The Rise and Fall of the Working Class, how we had ended up in the early 21st century with a view of the British working class, um, which is very much about, on the one hand, a class that has entirely disappeared, and then on the other hand, almost in the same breath, by the same politicians and writers and journalists, conceived of as a class of um, uh, delinquents, an underclass, really. Um, And to see whether we could do something more than just put out the nostalgic refrain that has dominated much of British political and media debate over the last 20 years <laughs> about the respectable working class that we have lost. Um, uh, and, and indeed, that, I think, is the, is the central task of the book. In terms of the, the material that, that I used for it, um, we're blessed with material for a book like this. Um, I used a great number of... Uh, social surveys which had been conducted in mid and late 20th century Britain. Those of you who were familiar with the work of the sociologist Mike Savage, um, who's a a close friend and colleague of mine, um, will be aware that he's recently written about the importance of social investigation as a frame through which we understand um, working class life and indeed ordinary everyday life um, in Britain in the 20th century. And one of the tasks that I undertook was to go back to the raw data that the social surveys had collected to look at the responses of working class people who social investigators had gone to and to see what I made of it 20, 30, 40 years on. I also relied on a lot of uh, working class memoirs um, and autobiographies and then also uh, undertook 50 oral history interviews specifically for this project which were dealing with groups who hadn't previously been 
uh, looked at in any great depth using oral history. Um, so particularly the generation who were born in the 1940s and then the later generation who were born in the 1970s. And they were the kind of youngest group that I looked at in the book. So people who are now in their early, early 40s were sort of the, the lower end of, of the demographic that I chose to look at. And the, the book really divides the, the century from 2010 into three parts, and I'll, I'll say something briefly about each part. So the first section um, I call Servants, and that takes us from 1910 to 1939 and the outbreak of the, of the Second World War. Um, and there were two linked reasons for that, one being that servants were the single largest group of working people right up until the eve of the Second World War. Um, and I give a lot of popular talks about the book. The book um, found a very wide readership in Britain. So I go to a lot of um, public libraries and adult education classes and I talk about it. And that's often something which is very um, striking to people and it resonates with their own family history because so many people were servants. But at the same time, it really contradicts what we tend to think of as the kind of um, predominant narrative of working class life in Britain in the 19th and 20th centuries, which is that the stereotypical working class person was a man um, working in heavy industry. And, and actually, I think it's really important that we take on the fact that women are really central to the history of the working class, not an addition, um, but actually very central to it. Um, and that that centrality is not something that surprises many of the audiences that I speak to, although they say, well, I, I didn't think the numbers bore out my own family or my own community's experience. Um, because the majority of servants were women, and not only that, they were young women who had to leave home at the age of 12 or 14 to go into service um, because their parents simply couldn't afford to keep them at home anymore. Um, and that single lesson that they learned growing up, which was that their fathers, even if in work, could rarely afford to keep them in the parental home into early adulthood, um, was something that really shaped their aspirations during and, and after the Second World War. Could we leave it, actually? Okay. Um, it's just quite distracting. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, it, the linked reason why I think it's very important to call that period period of service <coughs> and of service was because I think that um, Okay, merci. Um, yeah, the, so, sorry. The other reason um, why it's important, I think, is because um, I think that the, the fact that many people were servants was really central to, and should be central to how we understand social and political culture throughout those decades. Um, Ramsay MacDonald, very prominent Labour politician, said in the early 1920s, Britain remains a country divided between those who serve and those who are served. And, and that, I think, is really fundamental um, to our understanding of a country where the history is so often written as the first industrialised nation, um, the nation that brought in liberal welfare legislation during the 1910s, this idea that it's really a modern democracy um, by the 1920s. It, is something that I think we needs to be destabilised, really, um, particularly at the moment when there are a group of um, modern British historians who are seeking to rewrite the history of the 20th century with democratisation as the kind of central narrative. Um, I worry about the potential uh, Whiggishness um, of that. What McDonald's 
conceptualization of society at this time also reminds us, of course, is that inequality was not seen as a bad thing. Um, it wasn't even seen just as natural. It was seen as good. It was seen as the way that society should be um, by very many prominent people. And if we look at what happened um, uh, during those decades, uh, we can see um, that, that this was played out in many of the labour disputes at the time, which I'll come on to shortly. Um, a lot of historiography on welfare legislation in Britain focuses on the post-Second World War welfare state um, and suggests that this treated the male manual worker as the kind of normative uh, working class figure. Um, and there tends to be aligned with that a castigation of the British left because it was a centre leftist Labour government that brought in that welfare legislation. But in fact, we need to understand that that kind of normative model of the male worker was very present in the earlier social welfare legislation that was enacted in the 1910s by a very different liberal government. Um, in the National Insurance Act debates um, around 1911, for example, when the government decided to introduce national insurance for the first time, there was a huge political debate about whether servants should be included or not. What was very interesting in the debate, which ultimately concluded that servants should not be included, was that it became clear that emotional and domestic labour were not seen as concerns of the state, not something that should or could be legislated for. Um, and much of the correspondence that went to the government and was published in the national media around the time by servants' employers um, made the point that it, service was something that was practised in private family homes and that these relationships in private households should be very much divorced from what was happening in the marketplace. Aligned with that was a sense that the worth of servants cannot be simply quantified, um, but also shouldn't be because of the risk of introducing antagonistic industrialised workplace relations um, into private households. We see, I think, those same attitudes coming to the fore again in the late 1940s and indeed since um, in ongoing debates over the last century about taking caring labour seriously and who should really foot the bill for that. But this division between those who served and those who were served was never seen more clearly, I think, than in 1926, when the British general strike took place in May of that year, um, an episode in Labour history which has all but been forgotten in mainstream British social and political histories. People who went on strike um, in May 1926 were on the whole um, going on strike to preserve recently won rights to trade union recognition and to some degree of bargaining over workplace conditions. Um, but this raised an enormous outcry, leading the Conservative government to place troops on the streets um, and to take control of the national media in order after 10 days to defeat the strikers. So it goes back to what I said before, really, that democratisation was something that was highly contested, um, not least by many of those in charge. The victory for the Conservative government in May 1926 had a profound and lasting impact. Um, during the First World War, trade unions had won some important rights to negotiate um, for workers in terms of their working conditions and the way that pay was set. There was, during the war years and afterwards, leading up to 1926, still an ongoing debate within and outside the British Labour movement about what democracy really should look like and how much ordinary people should have say over not just their lives at work, but also increasingly their lives outside work, housing and so on. This was a period when the powers of municipal government were being discussed and expanded to some extent. The victory for the Conservative government in 1926 meant that ultimately democratisation was defined very narrowly about putting a cross on a ballot box every few years as opposed to any more kind of popular participation. And that lasts until the Second World War and is indeed enshrined in much of the post-war government's devotion to using experts and centralised planning rather than seeking more popular consultation and municipal governance. But at the same time that that was happening, we also see, despite all of this repression and, and the attempt to kind of um, manoeuvre servants out of the kind of welfare settlements that are coming out before the First World War, 
the rise of the so-called servant problem, um, which raises its head in middle-class press um, about once every 10 years during the 19th and early 20th centuries, and comes back again in the 1930s. And the servant problem was, was basically this, that middle-class householders could not understand why these young women who entered their households at the age of 14, after the school leaving age was raised in, in 1921, um, how it was that they had the audacity to leave domestic service, to go and work in factories or shops, as those opportunities began to expand in the slow economic recovery of the mid to late 1930s. Um, they were absolutely outraged and, and consistently took to um, the newspaper letters pages um, to talk about this. And indeed, servants' own oral histories testify to mistresses and masters who sought to lock them in their rooms rather than allowing them to give notice. But what's really important, I think, and something which is often missed by historians as much as it was missed by many of those middle class householders at the time, is that these servants were not simply servants who had been um, exported to these households at the age of 14. They were also the daughters and the sisters of these industrial male workers who had won these important trade union rights during and after the First World War and had then suffered defeat in 1926. And just to give one example of that, um, a domestic servant called Winifred Foley, she grew up in a rural area um, and she left home to enter domestic service in 1928 at the age of 14. Um, and she did so because her father was a miner who had taken part in the 1926 general strike and because of that he was unable to find regular work after 1926. So she had to leave home knowing that he didn't want her to go. Um, in 1934, Winifred Foley uh, ended up working uh, in a student hostel um, as a maid in London. And at this point, the economic recovery was just beginning in the major towns and cities. Um, and she was able to find work as a waitress. Now, this was a more poorly paid job than domestic service um, because it wouldn't give her board and lodging. But nevertheless, she decided to take it because of the additional independence that it would offer her. And she said this years later about her last day in domestic service. I washed up for the last time and I sang the red flag at the top of my voice, a socialist anthem, and I thought of my dad and all those other miners and I almost cried. And I think that just gives us a tiny glimpse into the fact that people are never just workers, they're always family members as well. And the lessons that they learn and the kind of political consciousness that they develop um, is structured by that as much as by their immediate labour relations. Later still, the young women like Foley who went into the factories of the late 1930s that were beginning to produce consumer goods were on the front line of disputes that often took place outside of formal trade union structures to minimise the introduction of Fordist assembly line um, production techniques. Um, and later still, in 1945, they made up a large proportion of the electorate who voted for the post-war Labour government, which brought in the welfare state and a commitment to full employment. So going on to um, the Second World War, the, the war immediately led to the collapse of domestic service. Women voted with their feet and went into the factories before conscription was even introduced. It also led to massive concern about public morale um, by a government which began as conservative and was still conservative dominated when Winston Churchill took it over in 1940, um, although he introduced some Labour members, not least Ernest Bevin, um, former trade union leader who became Minister of Labour and National Service. There was huge concern about morale and this led the government to begin funding um, opinion pollsters and social investigations um, for, on a mass scale for the first time. Um, there's increasing interest in these sorts of organisations among historians but perhaps not sufficient weight yet being given on the role of the Second World War in focusing the state's attention on them. And particularly the reason for the state's attention, which was a real fear that following the poverty and hardship that had followed, that, that had, um, uh, followed the First World War, um, 
and dogged many people into the 1930s, that people simply would not go and fight. And that was very much the question that opinion pollsters and social researchers were asked to go and survey the country about during the first 18 months of the war. And what they found was not particularly encouraging. They found that there was a great class division um, a, among people in their attitude to the war, that most working class people um, were disenchanted with the idea of war, that they had low morale and that productivity was low, that they believed that the war would offer them nothing. But they also found that there was scope um, for doing something different, for bringing people into the war effort, if war aims could be shaped in such a way that they would address people's long-standing grievances about economic insecurity um, and poverty. At the same time, a new kind of breed of social researcher, such as Richard Titmus, who would subsequently become famous for his work on the post-war welfare state, were able to demonstrate the efficacy of, of state coordination and provision in such areas as healthcare and industry, um, and the very beneficial effects that this could have, not only for popular living conditions, but also for economic growth. Um, and that was, of course, an economic lesson that was very much taken on not only in Britain, but by many post-war European governments um, in the 1950s and 60s. In 1945, the Labour Party came to power um, in its first majority government and very much was able to do so by tapping into the kinds of aspirations that these social surveys from the early 1940s illuminated so clearly. Um, aspirations for economic security, to live without fear of poverty, for a steady job and for a home of one's own, whether provided by the state or bought outright. And part of the genius of Labour's electoral machine in 1945 was that in doing this they were able to unite um, what Labour called workers by hand, that's manual workers, <coughs> and workers by brain, that's the bourgeoisie, in interesting new ways. And it was through that alliance and through the recognition that those aspirations that I've just outlined could appeal to those two groups that Labour was able to do so well in 1945. That's a huge difference to the 1930s where the conservative governments and the predominantly conservative newspapers um, did their best to um, effect a division between the manual working class on the one hand and the ordinary ratepayer, as they, as they called the minority of the middle class who were earning enough to pay rates, a particular form of taxes, um, by suggesting that the, latter, um, the latter's income uh, was uh, uh, under pressure from the kinds of wage demands being made by the manual working class. The post-Second World War period um, in Britain is often talked about as a kind of golden age, really, um, when uh, a welfare state was introduced and um, full employment um, uh, came into existence. And it, it's certainly true that increasing regulation of the financial <coughs> international markets and the impact of this on the labour market and the, the related ability of the Labour government to introduce full employment had a hugely beneficial effect on working class people. So too did the introduction of a welfare state, although that had just as much of an impact on the middle class. So it's really full employment and international regulation of finance that really deliver some important benefits for working class people in this period. Nevertheless, there's a very strong identification, popular identification with being working class through the 1950s and 1960s, partly imbued with pride in a period when union, um, trade union membership was, was rising rapidly, um, partly imbued with a pride that came out of the Second World War and the kind of post-war settlement narrative that suggested that full employment and a welfare state were a reward for working class people having won the war. Um, uh, but partly also class identification, if we burrow down and look through the surveys and what people were saying when they were asked about it, also testified to continuing inequality um, and to the fact that there was still widespread dissatisfaction with the fact that these basic aspirations that I outlined earlier um, were still not being addressed by post-war governments entirely. It was not the case that Labour or indeed the Conservative governments that followed it, 
sought in any dramatic way to erode the gap between the richest and the poorest. Neither did they seek to um, take apart elitist institutions such as um, opening up university entry to a, a broader population um, or dismantling the private education sector, which has always exerted um, a very powerful influence on British political and economic life. It's also the case that if we think about the simple economics of the 1950s and 1960s, uh, we can see that people had to work very hard indeed to bring about the affluence, which is often the key word used to describe the post-war period. <coughs> Living standards by any economic measure went up in the 1950s and 1960s, but they did so largely due to the older kinds of financial strategies used by working class families, namely hard work and a lot of it. In the 1940s through to the 1970s, we see a big increase in the proportion of married women going out to work for the first time. And if we set that against the fact that there are more teenagers staying on in education um, uh, or not taking on full-time work at the earliest possible opportunity, we can see a trend which is then borne out by oral histories, which is very much that parents, but particularly mothers, played an important role in giving the children who were born in the 1940s new educational and leisure opportunities as a result of their own labour. Put simply, more mothers go out to work, fewer sons and daughters have to. But working class families still have to rely on two breadwinners in order to make ends meet. As consumption of houses, um, luxury goods goes up in the 1950s, so too does the use of credit. Um, there's not a sense in which people are able to afford everything on their basic income. Overtime is something which increases massively in the 1950s and 1960s in most sectors. And so although the, um, uh, the, the standard basic uh, working hours um, within British industry <coughs> decline in the 1950s and 1960s, the actual number of hours worked by uh, people remained the same between about 1945 and 1975 because so many of them uh, were undertaking um, overtime. The cultural impact um, of the war and its aftermath on the so-called baby boom generation, those who were born in the mid and late 1940s, um, is something which really still endures as a popular image of the 1950s um, and 1960s, and you can see it on some of these images behind me here. Um, in fact, in this period, teenagers were really um, the only se affluent section um, of the working class, um, and as such, their affluence was often enjoyed vicariously um, by many of their parents. When I was interviewing people, one of the stories that I was told about repeatedly was about mothers going back to work in order that sons and daughters could not just stay on at school longer, um, but also have new clothes, be able to go to the new discos, the new clubs that were opening up, be able to afford um, a scooter or a holiday. Um, because they said, in the words of um, Alan Watkins, a man who grew up in uh, Coventry, an industrial town, um, and whose family had moved there from South Wales where his father had, had been unemployed for many years. Um, they said, you go out and have the good time that we never could have. Um, and there was a real sense of parents helping their teenagers to enjoy this period. Very different, I think, from the images of generational conflict um, with which sociologists often conceive of this period. I said that class still existed, and I've tried to give a kind of sense of how the, the older financial strategies of, of the working class um, had to continue in this period due to um, their continued reliance um, on, on full-time work and lots of it in order to make ends meet and get the better life they were, they were told they should be able to aspire to. The other way in which we see this playing out is in terms of education and social mobility. Um, in Britain at the moment, there's a huge debate going on about um, the lack of social mobility, the inability of people from the bottom of society to rise up to the top. Um, and it, 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 always this debate is predicated on the assumption that in the years between 1940s and 1970s, 
um, there was a great deal of social mobility and that this was brought about by the fact that Britain had an education system which meant that children were selected at the age of 11 for certain types of secondary education um, with 20% of them being selected for an academic education. Um, now, as you may be aware, in Britain, the situation is uh, in most areas that uh, at the age of 11, children simply transfer to non-selective secondary schools. Um, so this is really an attack on that system um, uh, by uh, politicians who say, well, we need to go back to the period when uh, we selected the top brightest, 20%, and gave them opportunities. In fact, what my work shows, and I'm only really corroborating here what sociologists have said, is that the education system played no part whatsoever in bringing about social mobility and never has done and probably never will do. That actually the reason why we see um, uh, a, a huge section um, of working class children um, experiencing mobility um, between coming from a manual working class background and going into white collar work or professional work is to do with structural change in the labour market. The welfare state and industrial planning um, gave rise to new types of profession, new types of job that were then defined as professions. Um, technical work was one. Nursing was another. The National Health Service expands rapidly in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, teaching is another because secondary education becomes compulsory and free for the first time in Britain after the Second World War. And it is indeed these professions, nursing and teaching, within which we see the greatest influx of children from working class backgrounds going when they're talked about as socially mobile. The notion that education um, selected people um, uh, for these uh, jobs simply isn't borne out um, by, the, by the data. It's the case that many people um, were able to experience um, white collar work and <coughs> professional work. But it's also the case that what we might call, and what in Britain is, uh, are called the senior professions, law, academia, those kinds of very, very well remunerated jobs, um, that actually social mobility into them did not increase at all in this period um, and certainly hasn't increased since either. A much more um, uh, common explanation than the one that I've just given for a lack of social mobility tends to be that working class parents simply aren't aspirational for their children. They don't, they don't want enough for them. They're not ambitious for them. And that's also not borne out um, by my study. Very common was the experience of someone like Billy Rainford, who grew up in Liverpool, um, and whose parents were extremely ambitious for him to get a better education um, than they had had. His father uh, was a, a bus driver, um, and his mother uh, was a shop assistant. And as in many working class families then and since, it was very much Billy's mother who was at the forefront of encouraging him um, to think about getting um, a better kind of job, one that paid better, one that would give him more leisure, give him more security, um, and also wanted him to have a better education simply for the sake of having a great education and having the kind of interest that that could give. So Billy remembered that when he, was, um, when he started at school at the age of five, um, in the early 1950s, his mother went back to school, went back to work and bought toys and books for the children and helped them with their homework. And like many men of his generation in Britain, he remembers very well taking the exam at the age of uh, 11 that would determine what kind of secondary school he would go to um, and finding out that he had failed. Um, and he said, um, I came home that day and my dad was sat at the kitchen table and I said to him, has the letter come? And he looked at me and nodded. And I said, and? And he shook his head. And Billy said, and I felt such a failure. Um, and I felt ever since that I failed my mum that day and I've carried it with me as guilt. That individualization of what I would argue is <coughs> class is something which really began with that generation and has um, continued subsequently, this kind of myth that you're now in an equal society or one that offers equal opportunity, 
um, is one that's been incredibly pervasive and which does lead people to internalise failure as something which they must be responsible for. Nevertheless, for Billy's generation, unlike the younger one, who I'll touch on very briefly before I end, that narrative of meritocracy went alongside this narrative that I mentioned before of being deserving of welfare and of full employment because they and their parents had won the war. Um, and that narrative, interestingly, was also experienced by many migrants to Britain in this period even those who had not been directly involved in the war effort. There was a kind of sense that having won the war, Britain was going to win the peace by showing the world what a flagship national health service, council housing, full employment, committed state could look like and what it could deliver. And I was very struck how many people felt themselves to be not just recipients of that, but to be very much bound up in delivering that, particularly those of Billy's generation. And just to give one example there, a woman called Betty Ennis. Betty was um, Iranian by birth. She was dark skinned. She came to Britain in the 1940s with her British born father um, after the Second World War meant that they had to leave um, the Middle East where they were then living. Um, they settled in Coventry and Betty got a factory job and subsequently um, a council house provided by the local council for herself and her husband who was also a migrant from Ireland um, and for their three children. And she still lives today on the same house, um, housing estate on the edge of Coventry. Betty certainly didn't have a rosy view of Britain. She experienced a great deal of racism in her first years um, uh, in Britain. But she said that she had never experienced very much racism on the housing estate and felt very at home there. And when we piece together the history of that housing estate, what we see is that the narrative which currently dominates political debate about immigration, which is there's only a scarce number of resources and you know we need to work out who's deserving of them, simply wasn't there in areas like post-war Coventry, which had a, a Labour council. Um, instead, the emphasis was really placed on um, providing this housing estate um, as a means of providing opportunities for a great number of people, um, immigrants from overseas, but also the children of local workers who didn't have any housing locally. And this was made into a great opportunity um, to build new schools, to build new shops and so on. And the whole community um, was imbued with this sense of, of this as a kind of positive move, rebuilding the country after the war as a democratic place in which popular participation was going to be absolutely crucial. And it helped them to get over some of the hurdles that began to be placed in their way in the 1950s when conservative governments came in and reduced investment in housing and in public services. In that situation, Betty told me, um, we got together um, and organised um, a residence association. Uh, we provided after school care for the children. We went and decorated the houses that hadn't yet been decorated, and it went on and on. And this happened in many other communities as well. They didn't feel that they should have to do those things for themselves, but they saw themselves equally as pioneers um, and as part of rebuilding a country after the war. Now, by the 1970s, that generation brought up to believe they deserved more from life um, than their parents had had were young adults. Um, having been the teenagers of the 1950s and early 1960s, they were now in the factories um, and offices of Britain. And it's therefore no surprise that it's in this period that we see a huge rapid increase in trade unionism, in white collar work and in nursing and so on. And we also see very many wildcat strikes outside the confines of trade unionism, um, as people demand autonomy <coughs> and control um, over their working conditions and indeed over the governance of the factories and offices in which they work and over the housing communities within which they live. 
This desire for autonomy wasn't, wasn't new. In fact, I'd argue that it's one of the continuities um, in working class life throughout the 20th century. Um, and it can come out in individualistic ways as well as in collective ways. For example, many of the social surveys conducted in the period between the 1930s and 1960s found that the predominant aspiration of many working class men and women was to start their own small business. And that that was as true for those who were radical socialist trade unionists as it was for those who voted conservative. What was interesting in the 1960s and 1970s was that the trade unions and the labour movement more broadly were able to harness that desire for greater autonomy um, within a more collective campaign that talked about trying to have a, more of a degree of control over how British industry was organised, for example, or over how new communities, housing communities, um, were planned. Now, What's remarkable to me in retrospect is how quickly this history of the 1970s, which is really one of a generation um, seeking to realise the aspirations that they've been brought up to believe um, should be their birthright, at a time when the economic situation internationally is becoming shakier and more insecure, how remarkable it is that that history is then rewritten as one in which the 1970s is a decade of economic recession leading into the 1980s precisely because these workers, these tenants got too greedy and destabilised the whole political and economic order. What's often forgotten is that the um, states of emergency that characterised early 1970s Britain were initiated by the Conservative government under Edward Heath. They were not brought about by trade unionists. And also what's forgotten is that there was a great choice that British politicians had to make about how they would deal with um, the economic situation as it became more insecure in the late 1960s as competition from West Germany and Japan in industry began to increase and particularly in the early 1970s when the international oil crisis um, became very serious. There was a choice how to deal with that, as there always is a choice how to deal with economic crisis. And the Labour government of the mid-1970s made that choice against the wishes of some of its cabinet ministers, as you can see if you look at the papers, um, to align with powerful employers within the Confederation of British Industry um, and to enact public spending cuts. And if we look at the history of the Confederation of British Industry, we see that it's simply a pressure group that comes out of the, early 19, of the, the late 1960s, is very threatened by the demands that these workers are making for more democratic control over the workplaces, and is lobbying government from the late 1960s onwards to do something about it. So the sense that there are certain disputes in the early 1970s that simply make it inevitable that the British government will go to the IMF, will introduce public spending cuts, it is just not there. Um, and I think that's important to take on given what's currently happening um, with public spending cuts um, and, and the kind of political rhetoric around austerity um, in Britain and, and elsewhere. It's therefore interesting that the official memory of the 1970s of the trade unions got greedy and the country went to rack and ruin coexists in many people's minds, including the people who I interviewed, with their own experience. So you have accounts like that by, for example, Terry Rimmer, who was a factory worker in the 1970s, who said, well, the unions got greedy. But at the same time, when he talked about the reasons why he went on strike in his workplace, talked very much about the sense of um, frustration with um, uh, a managerial uh, elite who in his words and in the words of many others, were complacent in the face of international competition from West Germany and elsewhere, um, who needed new ideas, and talked about himself and his fellow workers as people who could give those ideas if only they were given the chance. Now, turning very briefly to the final part of the book, which I call The Dispossessed, um, for reasons which anyone familiar with the history of the 1980s and 1990s um, will probably not be surprised by. Um, 
I'll just talk very briefly about um, uh, three elements of this. One is the extent to which um, histories of the working class have been challenged by the fact that a large working class vote helped to bring Margaret Thatcher's Conservative government to power in 1979 and helped to keep her there subsequently. Two things to say to that. One is that we need to remember that that working class vote diminished for the Conservatives over the 1980s. But the other is that, in a way, working class Toryism is no surprise. One of the things that the British Conservatives have always been very adept at doing is to answer, tap into this desire that people have for autonomy. And never were they able to do so more successfully than in the late 1970s, when Labour had basically said, yeah, we cannot deliver the post-war welfare state <coughs> anymore. We are no longer committed to full employment. This is a free market but we're going to keep things like council housing going in some kind of way. They will stagger on. What Margaret Thatcher promised was that people would be able to buy their own homes. And this has become enshrined in political myth in Britain that any political party that does not promise home ownership is not going to win an election. But actually talking to people who took advantage of the Thatcher legislation to buy their own home, what you realise is that they did this as a last desperate move to get themselves out of economic insecurity at a time when the future of council housing looked increasingly uncertain and the rents that one had to pay as a council tenant were rising rapidly and very unpredictably. Faced with a lack of control over public housing and public services more generally, people chose in large numbers the Thatcherite promise that they would be able to just look after number one if they stuck with her. Many of them subsequently were disillusioned and indeed left and didn't vote um, Conservative again. Um, the pity of it is that they then pretty much didn't vote at all for any political party. The second point that um, I want to make is one which has been made by the historian Jim Tomlinson that we might do rather better to think about rather than thinking about the late 20th century in Britain as somehow experiencing a schism in 1979, we might think about deindustrialization as something which had begun to happen in the, in the 1960s and comes right up to the present, which is a different kind of narrative to the sort of post-war declinist one that some earlier right-wing historians have put out. Um, and more acknowledges the role of powerful players like, for example, the Confederation of British Industry um, in seeking to disempower the working class and destroy trade unionism in a way that destabilised the post-war settlement from the late 1960s onwards. Deindustrialisation also helps us to understand the way in which men's and women's fortunes were differentiated and diverged significantly in this period. From the late 1960s onwards, we see another new trend in women's employment, and that is the increasing employment of married women with children. <coughs> Previously, as I said, the proportion of married women in the workplace increased. From the late 1960s, we begin to see those with young children remaining in the workforce, um, very often in households where men's employment seemed insecure or was, it, or was even non-existent, as male unemployment rose. Um, with deindustrialisation. Divorce rates increased in the 1980s very rapidly and a rising proportion of those divorces were initiated by women. The economic historian Avner Offer has suggested that the rise in divorce is due to affluence producing selfishness and a kind of individualism. But I think we'd do rather better to think about the way that economic independence gave women a new, if slight, individualised power strategy because they knew that they would be able to be economically independent in their own right. That was important for many of them because the economic changes that deindustrialisation brought to many working class households, with women in some cases becoming the main or sole breadwinner, were not mirrored in cultural changes. We know from oral history testimonies that in most cases women were still expected to undertake the double burden of childcare as well as paid work, um, with very little recognition of that from this generation of men. They had to wait one generation on to get that. <coughs> 
And the third final point I want to make is about the importance of emotional and caring labour, which takes us back, I think, to that earlier history of domestic service and why it's so important that we own that within the history of the working class. Um, emotional labour has become increasingly important to the, gener the youngest generation that I looked at, who are now in their early 40s. What do I mean by that? The service sectors expanded in Britain, as in many European countries, over the last 30 years. Um, and increasingly, young women, and more recently young men, find their work in call centres, in fast food restaurants, the kinds of jobs where offering a public face, offering customer service is absolutely key to what one does. Even people who are not in those kinds of frontline jobs are very often in workplace relationships where they're not expected to have a set of skills as they might have been in an earlier generation, such as being a carpenter. Um, they are expected to um, offer um, a personality which is pleasing to their boss um, and which espouses certain um, aspects of their job, whether it's public service or creativity, which is another word which is used on many job ads now for people who are, for example, going into website design um, or financial <coughs> middle management. On the surface, these people, when I was writing the book, looked like they were better off than their mums and dads who had been, on the whole, in manual work. Um, but actually, and, and this is something which I, I sort of tried to make quite a lot of in the book, but in fact it's kind of common knowledge now because the left has managed to get people to take this on board, they were in fact highly insecure. We're talking of course about a generation who have um, uh, in most cases no pension rights, um, who are very often employed in casual work, who are employed in zero hours contracts. Um, and what interested me was the way in which they uh, internalised and experienced this kind of um, emotional labour um, in ways which can have very important consequences for class politics. They're increasingly encouraged to identify with their work, but whereas an older generation might have identified with a set of skills that they could take with them from employer to employer, this generation, despite being much better qualified in educational terms than, than any previous generation, um, now see their personality as only being validated or affirmed by their employer. Um, because in order to do well at your job, you have to have a, a really good personality. You have to be um, uh, the person that that job wants you to be. If you're not doing your job well, then there must be something wrong with your personality. And this is something which women in particular felt. So just to give one example, um, a woman called Jackie, the daughter of a shipyard worker, um, Jackie left school at 18, determined, she said, to show what you could do with um, a wide smile, plenty of charm and plenty of get up and go. And for 10 years or so, she did just that. And she rose through the ranks of an oil company, eventually becoming personal assistant to one of the managing directors. Then, in her early, nine, in her early 30s, um, it was discovered that her husband, who had also worked at the firm, um, was leaving to work elsewhere. He was doing what we're encouraged to do in a free market. He was being flexible and adaptable, and he got a better job. Jackie was immediately sacked because the firm didn't trust her. They thought that if she stayed, she might give away um, their secrets. And she found it impossible to get another job <coughs> in the sector. She had a nervous breakdown at the age of 31. And this kind of um, despair, depression, um, personal crisis was something that I heard again and again from people of her generation who had experienced redundancy um, or failure at work in some ways. This group are less likely to identify as working class than the older generations that, that I've mentioned. Um, though it's important not to overstate that, still over 60% of British people today identify as working class and trade unionism continues to rise among one section of the workforce, women under the age of 50. So it, it's interesting that the, the picture is not clear cut. But two other things, that I, two other thoughts that I wanted to leave us with. Um, one of them is that they are likely to see themselves as being treated as working class. And that's why I think that opinion polls and so on don't fully capture what's happening with class in, in Britain today or indeed in Europe today. Um, 
they talk about being um, about experiencing life as working class people when they begin to talk about their workplace relations and the way in which they feel their employers are treating them unfairly. The term working class is very often seen as a badge of shame. They don't necessarily want to own it, but they do see it being applied to them and they understand what that means. They particularly um, begin to think about inequality as something which is unjust when talking about their children. Because in a world which reifies, to some extent, caring and emotional labour through jobs, of course, motherhood becomes incredibly important in that world. And we know that it is in, in the neoliberal world in which we live. There's a kind of cult of parenthood. You can't affect anything outside your family, but you, you have to do everything for your children. They've got nobody else now. On the whole, the younger generation that I spoke to had children of school age, um, and felt themselves to be pretty good parents. And so as their children got to a stage of schooling and labour market entry, where it was clear that despite having pretty good parenting, they weren't even going to be able to get a secure job, these parents began to get angry. And, and it was in talking about their children and their own caring and emotional labour that many of them, men as well as women, began to talk in the ways that earlier generations had talked about the injustice um, with which their employers had treated them and about wanting to think about bringing about a fairer world and in, in, indeed began to talk about themselves in relationship to others. I think what that reminds us is that much though I have a lot of respect for histories of identity and histories of emotion, we do need to think about relationships as very important because it's as family members um, and as workers that people will very often talk about injustice. People are sometimes a bit backward at saying, I feel that I've been treated unfairly or I feel I deserve more. It's often much easier for us to talk in that way and to think in that way and act in that way for other people. So just to very briefly conclude, um, I've tried to suggest that class is a very strong narrative of Britain's last century and that class needs to be about how people acted and were acted upon. I suggested that if we stop trying to look to the working class to either be socialist heroes or working class Tories and realise that party politics was never most people's overriding interest, then we can see that a desire for autonomy and control was evident across different generations and could be realised individually or collectively. The most successful strategies in this regard were always collective ones, um, particularly um, through trade unionism and mobilisation around the workplace. Social mobility was never widespread and the disruption of older labour patterns was never so simple as, 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 as uh, the idea that there was greed and the sudden turn by the working class from socialism to conservatism in the 1970s. We also need to realise that the single largest group of working people were never male manual workers. Until 1939 they were servants. After that we begin to see nurses and clerical workers becoming increasingly important. And it's important that we deal with this so that we can leave behind the nostalgic narratives that are so common when dealing with the working <coughs> class um, about traditional communities and how they looked. The, these earlier disruptions that I've talked about often brought about by people's own desire to, for example, leave domestic service or the slums behind, are vital for our understanding of working class life and the extent to which the economic and political strategies of the past 40 years have changed class relations. It's not the case that class has been killed off by industrialisation, but it is the case that the way that class politics is often played out could be and can be through caring and emotional labour in a way that was true of the period before the Second World War and is increasingly becoming conspicuous today. Thank you.